Um, so hi everyone, I wanted to welcome you today to our On Track event focused on uh, generational diversity and emerging leaders. Um, I wanna thank our sponsor today, Upper Iowa University. Um, and I know by this point we have all been on a zillion Zoom calls, but uh, please leave yourself on mute uh, and then consider turning on your camera. It's nice to know that there are actually people on today with us. Um, and then I'll be monitoring chat. So feel free to put any questions in the chat as we go. Um, we will leave time for a Q&A at the end, but we want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and then post event, this recording and the slide deck will be sent out to um, everybody who registered. Um, so at this point, I wanna introduce Jim Morgan. Jim is the Vice President of Development and Workforce Strategies for MRA. He has been helping employers build their talent supply chain for more than 30 years. His real world hands-on experience has resulted in providing recruiting and retention solutions that really work. Jim will share stories and best practices from companies throughout the Midwest. Um, so Jim, I'd love to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back again. Um, last time was in person, this one's virtual, but um, promise to try to make it entertaining for you nonetheless. Um, the topic of the day is really emerging leaders and what is now evolving as, as generational diversity. And I would say at MRA, we have about 3,000 employers who are members of ours. And this emerging leaders and training these emerging leaders is probably one of the, the top contact points that, that we have right now. And I'm going to try to share with you why that's happening, but then also talking a little bit about what this has meant for some of our member companies and you know how they're trying to deal with it. And there's a lot of, um, oh, these young kids, you know, they just don't know it the way we used to do it. Um, I had one come up to me, not a young kid, but one of our emerging leaders the other day and said, you know, I don't get it. And I said, well, what, what is it that you don't get? He says, you people, meaning us old folks, you people are always saying, oh, just wait, you'll learn. Why should I wait to learn if you already know the answer? Why don't you just help me and explain it to me right now? And it's one of those differences between when I was the younger worker and now as the older worker, um, that things are just a little bit different. They want answers. They're going to ask why, and they have good reason for it. And you know, I think we've got to begin to understand that they function a little bit differently. And I would also say to the person who says, these young kids, I'd go right back to, well, those parents. If you want to know what created the millennials, it was the baby boomers. What created the Gen Zs, it was the Xers. So if someone's got a complaint that they want to make, I guess I'd, I'd take it back to the manufacturer, as they say, and say, okay, where did this start? And you know, who's they really responsible for this? But the reality of all of this is in this generational game, every generation that's ever come on the earth has thought, the so generation after them is the one that's going to destroy everything. And so far, that hasn't been true. Um, I was part of the dope smoking, long haired, anti war, never going to amount to anything, baby boomers. And now we're in charge of everything. So I know the generation before me didn't look on us all that fondly. We don't look at the one after us. And it just it continues. But it's something that, you know, I think we've got to get over a little bit and begin to look at what are the strengths and what are the reasons for some of the differences across these generations, because this next group is really going to bring some things or they do bring some things that nobody before ever has. And so we begin to stereotype again that I gave this presentation about a month ago with one of my uh, co-workers who's a millennial, and we just sort of asked, okay, you're looking at the two of us. Which one of you ask? Which one of you are are you asking for tech assistance in the conference room? Who do you think would do your strat planning? Which one of you knows finances? If you needed a project manager, which one would you pick? If you needed a spokesperson, which one would you pick? If you had a question about TikTok, which one of us would you talk to? And you know, we went down the line, and some of these were exactly what you thought, and some of them were the opposite but the stereotype was strictly around the age thing. And part of this again is, I think we've got to start looking at people's skill sets and not necessarily jumping to conclusions on things, but also understanding that 
these last two generations have brought more technology to the workplace than anybody else that we've ever seen. And they are obviously very comfortable with social media. And we'll talk about that um, in just a minute. We also introduced ourselves and actually I introduced her and she introduced me and I left hers out because she's not here, but I said, all right, you're introducing me. What is it you're gonna say? Well, you're dumb enough to leave me a voice message. You write memos that are way too long. You still watch commercials on television and you can't believe I've got an Android phone still. And we had some fun with this because again, we look at things completely differently, learn a lot from each other, but just in that alone, you can begin to say, okay, there's a communications issue here that's gonna be very different between two generations here. And you can add two more to the mix and you can begin to see why this begins to cause you know, some troubles. So what we'll do today is just talk a little bit about what happened, um, where are we at? Does this really make any difference? Um, I'm gonna argue that I think it does and then provide you with some suge suggestions that we think you know, maybe this would be helpful. So what just happened? Well, the boomers are leaving and the Gen Zs are coming in and that is a monster replacement right now. And so it's changing the way that we do work. We've got old people that, you know, are staying on a little bit longer, but they're going to get out. And we've got young people who are moving around. And so what you would say normally is, well, the young people will be staying and the old people will be moving. That's true. But the reverse is true too. And again, I wouldn't lump everybody into one category or the other. We've now learned to work from anywhere. And especially with the Gen Zs, some of them haven't been to an office in their life. And so if they spent the first two years of their work career of the pan in the pandemic, and all of a sudden somebody says, hey, everybody back to the office, they never had to work in an office. Going to an office is foreign to them. And so how do we treat that and how do we adjust? We as a state, people aren't moving in, they're moving out. And so we've got a numbers problem, which I talked to the group about about a year ago, that demographically, the upper Midwest, Wisconsin in particular, we're not growing, we're not adding people. And in fact, the people where we do have growth are in the over 65 category. So all of these younger people matter because we need them. We also aren't having enough babies just to replace the people who are dying. So we are at a net loss just on natural. So if you start looking at people aren't moving here, we're not having enough kids. A lot of 25 year olds are looking to go someplace else where it's exciting. Um, now we're in a little bit of trouble because that migration pattern, if there's one thing we know about a 25 year old, it's they wanna go where the other 25 year olds are. Madison, Dane County is a bit of an attraction. Um, Eau Claire County was actually a bit of an attraction. And that's about it for the state of Wisconsin. So if we're trying to attract that next generation of leader, um, they're not coming here. And though we're gonna talk about generational diversity today, if you talk especially about people of color, um, Wisconsin is not a destination again for people. We are a very white state. I'm not saying there's anything right or wrong with that. But if you're a person of color and you're trying to decide where you want to move to, where you want to go, Wisconsin is probably not at the top of your list. And so that, again, makes it difficult for us to find people. And so these last two generations become more and more important. So if you look at what's happening out there, this is just between 1994 and 2017. You can see basically the boomers have started to drop off. The Xers are going up and the millennials weren't even on the scene and now they are 35% of the workforce about five or six years ago. And now we look out to 2030 and you're looking at a workforce now that's made up of 44% millennials, 25% Gen Xers and 22% Gen Zers. So there's gonna be a massive shift over this in the next about six or seven years where you know the baby boomers are going to pretty much be almost gone. And there's gonna be this need for a whole new group of leaders as we go through these next few years. So that's what's really been brought to our attention right now. And that's what companies are beginning to struggle with. So here's kind of where we're at. You know, this is sort of a depiction of what's kind of going on in the world right now that let's just talk communication style for a minute. As I move through the generations, handwritten note, then a phone call, then an email, then a text, 
and now Snapchat me, TikTok me. So you're gone from people who are, you know, carrying big briefcases to carrying computers to now it's basically on my phone. And somehow we're trying to figure out how are we going to communicate with all of these people? How are we going to keep everybody on the same page? And how do you just let people know what's going on? Because you don't have the luxury anymore of saying, well, we're just going to, you know, make 75 copies of this and put it in everybody's mailbox. And then we know everybody will get it. Um, it just doesn't work that way anymore. And that's made communications a little bit more difficult. We also go different places for our information. If I was looking to bake a cake, I would have asked grandma. My kids, when they were really young, might have looked at a cookbook. Now I'd Google it. They'd probably TikTok it and watch it be made. So where do we go for our, where is our source of information? Where is our source of truth now? And quite frankly, it depends who you are whether you want to go ask Google or you want to ask Siri or you actually want to look it up someplace is going to really make it matter um, depending on what generation you're a part of. The other thing that's changed dramatically is the career path and what expectations of younger workers are and how they want to go about figuring out what does my career look like? What do I want to be when I grow up and what is it going to take to get there? So let's stop and look at this for just a minute. For those of you that are old enough, or if you're not, it might've been your parent, you know, your career goal was to go to a company, be there for 30 years, build a legacy, build a reputation for yourself. And that's what you were gonna do. You were gonna be known for being able to do something really well. My generation was, we're trying to build, again, a career at an organization but we want to be seen as a leader who moved up through the ranks, who now is someone that you can go to and has the information. In both of those two cases, if you switch jobs, that was almost a bad thing. It's like, oh my God, what happened? You lost your job. You've got to go do something else. You know, the world may end. That has dramatically changed. Then you get to the Gen Xers who went into the whole workforce thinking, I'm building a portable career. I'm going to find the types of things that I like to do. I'm going to move around. I might have three jobs in six years as I try to figure out what exactly do I want to do? What skills do I want to acquire, want to acquire? And it very well may not be at the same place. And no one thought twice about somebody moving from one place to another to another. And then we get to the millennials who basically are building multiple careers at one time, possibly. They might have a couple of different jobs. They might be, they might have some kind of gig job on the side. They're trying to just figure out what's it going to take for me to get there. And I'm not going to worry about the traditional way of doing it. And all of you that are in HR now, you look at a resume today versus looking at a resume from 30 years ago. I mean, 30 years ago, if you saw a six month break in someone's uh, resume, you'd think, oh my gosh, what happened? What did this person do wrong? Where'd they go? Or if you saw someone who had worked for four or five different companies over the course of 30 years, you would have thought, oh my gosh, this person can't hold a job. Now you're looking at resumes where there may be six jobs in six years. And I don't think we're thinking, oh, they can't hold a job. I think we're thinking they're trying to figure out what they want to do and where they want to go. And let's start looking at the skill set that they've built up and all those different opportunities. So our career goals have changed dramatically. And so as I said, if I changed my job 40 years ago, you were, you know, that was sort of a pox on your house that what's happening there. If I changed a job, it's like, uh oh, I just put 15 years of experience on the line and now I'm gonna have to go somewhere else and try to figure out how to catch up again. The Xers, it's just what we did. It's what we had to do. It's what we did in order to get to where we wanted to go to. And millennials don't even think about it. This, this is not a, this is not a lack of loyalty thing, which I think people want to hang around their necks like, oh, you know, why won't you stay? It's not lack of loyalty. It's all kinds of opportunities. There are so many opportunities for people right now in terms of jobs that they can keep looking and there will be somewhere else to go. And it probably will pay a little bit more and they might offer better benefits and they might have more of a career path for me to follow. Those are opportunities that these generations have that I didn't. And so it's become just a normal part of their life to move a little bit quicker. So I just talked about, you know, the world has changed a little bit. 
we are looking more at what is someone's experience. Education is great. In certain fields, it is critical to what you want to do, but the way people are getting educated and where they're getting educated looks very different than it did when, again, 35 years ago, the, the stack of resumes probably got separated into, you have a bachelor's degree, you don't have a bachelor's degree. Now that's not so much the case. It's what's your experience? What are you able to do? And I'll take a look at that. I'm not gonna be there for 30 years. Two to five, it's probably getting even less than that. When I took a job, that was a commitment to that job of this is what I was going to do. Now it's looked at more as, do I believe in the organization that I'm working for? Do I believe I'm making a difference in what I do? That's what matters to me. The job doesn't define me. It's what the job allows me to do and what it allows other people to do. Our ability to find people. Right now, I would say if it's taking you longer than probably 10 days from initial contact of a candidate to actually hiring them, it's taking you too long because they are looking somewhere else and they will find something else. So we've got to move faster. We have to adjust to the pace of what's happening there and we're living in an Amazon world. So we've got to figure out how to provide an Amazon um, experience to the candidates that we've got. The application used to be a cover letter and a resume that you'd submit. We have people that are, McDonald's was recruiting on Snapchat. We have people that are being texted, here's the opportunity, we'd like you to come in today and getting a job offer the same day. Things are moving much quicker than they used to. And companies are now not as worried about yeah, we'll do a background check, but we can't wait two weeks to get it. So we're going to hire them anyway. They're changing on what their drug policy or drug testing policies are. They're looking at all kinds of different things to say, how do we make this fast? And how do we make this easy? We're seeing companies adjust to the younger generations with benefits. What's a benefit to me may not be a benefit to a 22 year old. And so to think that our standard benefits of Healthcare, retirement, vacation, pay, that's what you get, may not still apply to some of the younger folks that are coming in. Where is the student loan repayment? Because I care about that. Where is the pet insurance? Because I care about that. What about the Netflix subscription? Because I care about that. The world's changing. And so companies now are trying to differentiate themselves based on the benefits that they have to offer in terms of trying to attract people. Used to be we would look for a job and then we would move to it. Now people will move and then go find a job. And again, the market is different. So I can decide to go out to Portland where all the 25 year olds are or to the Carolinas or to Austin. And I know I'll be able to find something. So I'm mobile. And if I'm working remote, I can be anywhere. And so that changes the game for people, both positive and negative. But Wisconsin with a shortage of people being able to hire report, remote people actually help. In other places, it's been hard because it's an in-person type of job like manufacturing. And so they need people to actually show up. The workplace used to be set by rules and now it's really being set by flexibility. And that is a much harder workplace to manage. How come this person gets to work remote and this one doesn't? How come this one can come in at 10 and work until six? This one has to come in at eight and work till four. That's complicated things. And so it's made a hiring manager's job to be very clear on what objectives are for every worker in order to make sure that we're being fair to people. Workers used to live to work. Their job defined who they are. Younger folks are working to live. They will give you their all. They will work just as hard, but they have a lifestyle that they're trying to achieve and the job is the way to do that. So again, from an employer's point of view, you're now seeing companies try to use that flexibility to attract people. Which hours you work, when you work, where you work, have all become benefits now that companies are starting to offer in order to attract people. So does all this really matter? Is it really all that different between the generations? Um, let me just give you two examples. Because I want you to think about this in terms of the people that you have working with you, if you had somebody out of every generation. If you think about the family and where they came from, and I'm not going to say any one of these is the right way or the wrong way, or one is better or one is worse, but they are certainly different. And so someone might have been, you know, raised in a traditional two parents, 
2.6 kids, a dog, a cat, a bird. That was how they, that's how they grew up. A generation where maybe there was a little bit more divorce. People who had parents in two different places. A generation where they probably got home from school and nobody was there. A generation where families are coming together, where two kids from this family, two kids from that family, and seeing a variety of families, whether they, you know, two moms, two dads, whatever it might be, it has changed. And so those experience changes things. When you, especially when you look at something like diversity, people that are 25 years old have seen a lot more in their first 25 years in terms of diversity than I do. And so that changes their view on how they look at things. Take the issue of education of what it used to mean. For the veterans, that was, if you could go to college, that was, that was just, that was, you know, a dream come true. For my generation, it was almost an expectation. For the Xers, they started looking at it as this is a ticket to my destination. The millennials began to see this is expensive and it's costing me a lot of money and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pay it back. And now we're having conversations about, well, maybe it'll be free. But think again about what does that mean for everybody who's working for you that that bachelor's degree used to be, wow, that, that was all the difference in the world. And now different experiences provide you with different things and where you get your education might look very different. So people are coming with different experiences. So what does that mean in terms of the workplace? Well, think about the candidate experience. Think about the hiring experience. What are the types of questions that today's candidates are asking. They're asking about benefits, but they're asking about diversity. They're asking about their career path. They wanna know if they'll be able to work with the upper management to get the best experience possible. They're looking for different benefits. If you talk about when we're gonna meet and where we're gonna meet. If you say a meeting starts at eight, my parents were taught eight means 745. I was taught, just don't be late. My kids, yeah, we'll get there. You know, and so every generation looks at it differently. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying what's right or wrong, but they have a different understanding of what some of these things mean. And then you get to hours and whether that's, all right, business hours, we're working nine to five, that's it. Well, you know what? I'll work 10 hours a day, but I might work from four in the morning till seven. And then I'm going to go work out and then I'm going to shower. And then I'm going to work from like nine till noon. And then I'll have lunch. And then I'm going to take a nap. And then I'm going to work from two until eight that night. Is that okay with you? That complicates things. Now, are we getting the job done? Do people know what they need to do and it's getting done and it's not affecting customer or anything else? Okay, we can have some flexibility. But you can't take a $6 million, 20-ton machine home from the manufacturing facility and make widgets at night. So how do we juggle all of that? And how do we accommodate different people's um, expectations? So the emerging leaders, I think, has become a big deal for these reasons. One, they're having to take over things at a younger age. The baby boomers are leaving. And so we're having expectations of 30-year-olds now to be leading teams. They didn't get the opportunity that some of us had to watch other people make mistakes, and we didn't have to make our own. But then the question becomes, are we training them and are we preparing them to be able to do that if they're not going to have the same experiences that some of us have had. And I think in a lot of places, we're not doing that. They're becoming part of succession planning now because succession planning no longer is the CEO and maybe the CFO. It's every position we have. If that person goes down tomorrow, who steps in? Who steps in, in a lot of cases at the manager and director level, is probably someone that we've identified as an emerging leader. And those emerging leaders now are our bench strength. These are the people that we have singled out to say, this is the next group that's going to take over for us. And they might be taken over at 35 or 40, not 55 or 60. So are we preparing them and are they ready for that? And part of the way that we prepare them is, are we utilizing what they have to offer? On the technology side, there's no doubt. I mean, this isn't even a debate anymore. They've grown up with it. They know it. They know how to use it. And they're good at it. So are we talking to them about what's available? Are we using their skills to reverse mentor, to teach other people how to use the technology and use that, you know, using their skills for good instead of evil? They know more about social justice, community impact, and diversity than most of us that have been in the workplace for a while. 
They grew up with it. They had it on campus. They're seeing it in their lives and they want to do something about it and we can't ignore it. They want to work with people that don't look like them. They want to work with people who don't have the same ideas as they do. So what are we doing as an employer that gives them those experiences? I mentioned earlier, they understand social media. They've made a lot of mistakes by the time they're 25 and social media is a, it's just a different game. And knowing, you know, to have an argument on social media is a fool's task, it's, it's impossible. And yet, what do we wanna do? We wanna keep arguing. You know, what do you post? What don't you post? When do you argue over what you post? They don't, may not have any social, they may not have any specialized training in it, but they've lived it. And so they probably can put together the do's and don'ts of what social media looks like, as well as a lot of the, uh, of the, a lot of the rest of it. They bring a different perspective. And in doing strategic planning with companies, I'll often say to them, you need to have somebody who's 25 or 30 years old in the room when you're making any decisions. Not because they're the smartest person in the room, but they're going to know something that everybody else in the room probably doesn't know. And so that's a good, it's just a good mindset to have there. They're also going to ask why, and they're not afraid to ask why, and they're going to keep asking why until they get a real answer. And the answer can't be, well, because that's what we want to do. Okay, but why? If there's not a good reason for it, why are we doing it? And they're not being obnoxious. They're not being belligerent. They want to know, why are we doing this? It's a legitimate question that needs to be answered. They have presentation skills. My gosh, they've been on camera since the day that they were born. And if you want to get a 60-second video filmed, it'll probably take the CEO about an hour and a half, and it'll take a 25-year-old 60 seconds. And they're good at it. So do we put them in front of people? They're not scared of the camera. They're not scared of getting up in front of a group. So is that a skill set that we should be using? And they're used to doing a whole bunch of things at one time. Sometimes that may drive you crazy. Um, but they can handle things. They can do different things. They're used to juggling a lot of different things. So there's an opportunity there for those emerging leaders. So as we talk to companies then, we say, all right, what does your learning and development look like for these emerging leaders? And often people jump right to some sort of curriculum where we have this class, we have that class, we have a class on another thing, which is all good. But I would argue to you as a company, you have so many opportunities for learning and development that are just in the regular course of work. And these are things that don't even cost you anything. Giving them opportunities to be in a senior team meeting, to go to a board meeting, to reverse mentor someone in something that they're good at, to lead a project. Those are all things that if you find people that are emerging leaders, that's what they're craving. They'll sit through a class to learn a new skill, but they would rather be with the smartest people figuring out how decisions are made at your organization. So what are you doing once you've identified those people to say, what are the opportunities that we're going to provide for them? The other big, and I started with this one, the other big issue is how do we talk to everybody? And talk being a generic term in this case, because we have different ways that we prefer to engage. We have different ways that we prefer to be communicated with. And this raises all kinds of issues for companies that are trying to maintain a culture, trying to make sure that everybody's on the same page when you've got three, four, five, six different platforms that people are expecting to get their news in and we have to figure out how to deliver to them. And I think companies are missing that, that they don't understand now that we might have to do an email and create a video and have a podcast and figure out how to talk to people and have a summit somewhere if we truly want to get all of this information across to people. The way that Gen Zs are looking to get their information is not the same way that I want to get my information. We, mo we might both be holding a phone, but we're using it for very, very different things. This one I share with you because um, this one just sort of cracked me up. The way that we communicate. I was waiting online with one of our millennial workers we were trying to get into a Zoom call. They hadn't started the meeting yet. And this was the email that I sent to the person that we were waiting on. All I said was, Aaron, we are online just waiting to be left into the room. She almost had a heart attack. You are so mean. You're just yelling at him, telling him he better be in the room because we're starting our meeting now. 
And I said, no, I'm telling him I'm online and I'm just waiting. Like, that doesn't sound cruel to me. And then we got into a long discussion about, should there be a smiley face? Should there be an exclamation point? Should we have little unicorns on my email? It's another thing that's very different to people. The way that folks express themselves in emails makes a difference. And so now how do we figure out, am I shouting at someone when I talk like this? Are they gonna take it the wrong way? How do I express what I'm trying to feel in an email? People get different messages in different ways. So I would say to you for consideration, these are the types of things that companies are now doing with their emerging leaders to help them sort of figure all of this out and you know, truly become an emerging leader. Put in place a mentor program where you have people that are actually, their part of their job is to help the younger workers understand what the expectations are and what the way to get there might look like. Offer them up as reverse mentors. They're good at certain things that others of us are not. Let them be reverse mentors to other. It levels the playing field and lets people see each other as peers. Do the DISC assessments or the personality or things around emotional intelligence. Give them opportunities to see what's their communication style. How do they relate to other people? How do other people communicate? All of those things help them be a better leader. Get them involved in teams and team building. Let them be a part of something where they may not have to take the lead, but let them see how other people operate in a group and how other people lead and what some of their different skill sets might be. Put them on cross-functional teams that might be a little bit outside of their comfort zone. Let them be another voice in a room where it might be the descending voice. It might be the, the one that doesn't agree with everything else and see how they present themselves, see how they present their case, but give them those opportunities. Put them in charge of things. You know, even if there's a senior team member that's running something, let the emerging leader be the project team coordinator. Let them be the person that's managing what's going on. Let them run the meetings. Let them have to figure out how to put the agendas together. Those are all things that better prepare them for what it is that they're going to try to be doing as an emerging leader. Let them do the role reversal. You know, a lot of times you get stuck and you say, all right, let's just flip this around. You be me, I'll be you. Make the argument now and let me know. If I know your argument as well as you know your argument, I can probably beat you in the discussion because then I'll know mine better and yours just as well. It's a great way to have them look at things from another um, perspective and maybe even inform their own type of their own judgment. And then there's still no replace for a lot of the training. And it might come in 30 minute or 45 minute little bits. It might come in formal um, methods, but whether that's some sort of assessment, whether that's on leadership or communications or leading a team, difficult discussions, whatever that might be, I would say all should be part of your emerging leader program. And then include them in your succession plan. Doesn't necessarily have to be, well, you're four steps away from the president now, but it might be you are the lead in this department. So if the manager goes down, you are our next person or you're not running the whole department, but we're gonna give you this part of it and these two or three people might be reporting to you. It begins to build your bench again and it prepares people for what might be coming. Lastly, not to end on the bad news, but this is usually what happens. And when we're talking to companies about, they'll say, you know, we really should have an emerging leader program. And they'll say, okay. And they say, yep, we believe in it. All right, what are you doing? Well, we're not doing anything. All right, well, there's our first step. If we think we need an emerging leader program, what does that look like? All right, let's talk about it. Okay, we talked about it. Did you act on it? No, but we did talk about it now. Okay, so now we've at least talked about what an emerging leader program might look like, but that still doesn't get us anything. Do you know who your emerging leaders are? Oh yeah, do they know? No, we haven't told them yet. Okay, is anybody going to tell them that they've been identified as an emerging leader? Well, we're not sure that we want to because we're not really sure how we came up with this list. All right, well, how do you evaluate them? Well, right now, six of us get together and we kind of do a gut check and say, yep, those look like the five best ones. You might be right, I don't know. But what are you basing it on? What are your values? What are the criteria that you have? What, what makes an emerging leader in your organization? Because we all agree on what that is. We can probably figure out how to do it. But if you're using a different criteria than I am, then we're probably gonna be in trouble. 
All right, we need evaluation so we can, we'll put the criteria in place. All right, we did it. We picked them. We know what we picked them on. Now what? Well, we should probably give them some learning. We should probably train them. Okay, well, we don't have any curriculum for that. All right. Where are we going to go? What is it that we want our emerging leaders to know? What are the skills that if they don't have them, we can teach them? And if they do have them, we can improve, we can improve them. All right, now we're teaching them. So we're getting closer. We've figured it out. We've identified. We've come up with criteria. Now we're going to build the curriculum for them. But then how do we develop them? How do we do all of those things that was a couple of slides back? What are the opportunities that these people have where they can now begin to show or prove to us that they really are an emerging leader? All right, we can have them sit in on board meetings. We can have them be project managers. We can start to give them real life experience, but that takes time. That means somebody has to think it through and say, this person's an emerging leader in our marketing department. We should give them a branding opportunity to say, here's what we're trying to do. Can you put together a proposal for us? Or take this engineering plan and say, take this from beginning to end. How would you do it? How can we give them a real life work experience that helps them begin to develop? So now we're all the way through. We've done everything that we need to do. We've developed them. We've given them experience. What do they get for being a part of this? Because these people have gone the extra mile They've done the extra training. They've proven themselves to be our best workers. They've proven that they're ready for the next step. What's at the end of the rainbow for them? I'm not saying they have to become a director. I'm not even saying that you have to promote them. But there has to be a reason that we're putting these people through there, this. And I would argue it's because we want to keep them. So if we want to keep them, what's at the end of the rainbow for them? Is it you will get priority? in terms of the next hire that we know what you've done? Is there recognition involved? Is there money involved? What happens when they do all of this? Because we don't wanna put them through all this and then just say, well, that's great, but we don't have any job openings for the next seven years. So you have all these great skills, now you're overqualified. That's not what the end game should look like. So this becomes a lot of work where, you know, we can't really just say we're gonna have it we have to figure out what to do with it because otherwise we're right back to, well, we believe emerging leaders are critical, but that's really as far as we've ever gone. So that's what we're seeing now with companies with the emerging leaders is if we can get down to that second to last bullet point and said, yep, we've done all of these things. We know how we identified them. We know what we've judged them on. We know how we educated them, provided them experiences, and we know how we're going to keep them. Now we have an emerging leader program in place. And I think we're going to be in good shape hanging on to them. So that's a quick, that's sort of what we're seeing from companies um, that are putting the programs together, the things that matter to them. Um, if you've got your cell phone, the, the QR code there is my LinkedIn. If you want to um, follow me, um, there's my email address. If you've got any questions, I'm happy to take some now, but I'm also happy to do um, follow up later. If you um, would like to have a further conversation or talk about some of the things that we do with our companies. And with that, I will, uh, let's see. Lisa, do you want your last slide before I take questions or I can just keep sharing what's easiest? Um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll open it up for questions right now. Does anyone have okay. any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and go ahead. Oh, Kate, I, we can't hear you. I was double muted. I really wanted to make sure that nobody could hear me um, <laughs> during Jim's presentation. Um, Jim, thank you so much. Um, this is Kate with the Middleton Chamber. I always look forward to um, your presentations when, when you come. They're always very informative. Um, quick question about, <laughs> I've heard quite often, um, you know, the, the similar information about the benefits package where, you know, if you're 25 or younger, you don't, you can be on mom and dad's medical insurance. That's not necessarily a true benefit. So are people like the way are, is the implementation of a different benefit package, just figuring out, okay, if you don't want medical insurance, this, you know, is X amount of dollars. So pick Here's here's a menu of items, Hulu, Netflix, subscriptions, gym membership, whatever that is, and pick up to whatever you want. And then it's like a reimbursement type situation. 
you're seeing all kinds of things now. And, and this whole benefits area is one of those where, you know, the, I think the companies get innovative and out in front of the government and the laws. And that makes life very difficult to say, okay, are we discriminating against anybody here if we're offering this to this group and this uh -huh. to that group? So the cafeteria route of saying, maybe you've got a pool that says you have this much to spend on your benefits. You can either buy into the lower deductible health care, or you can use it towards your student loan, or you can do these other things. Those are the types of things that we're seeing companies now begin to offer. That's complicated. And so sometimes what you will see might be more, okay, Kate, you're going to come work for us. You just got out of college. Through our conversations, we've learned some things about you. And one of the benefits we're going to offer you in the offer letter is $200 a month towards your student loan payment. It's not necessarily in our bucket of benefits over here, but it's a value add to try to get you to come work for us. And so we might you know, offer that up on a one-off we, or we need you to be our new CFO. We're going to pay for you to go get your executive MBA. And so that's a, you know, that's a whole nother benefit off on the side that people are looking at. But I think for the most part, what companies are trying to do now is identify the workers that they're looking for. And again, not discriminatory by age or by sex or by color or whatever it might be, but who's got a lifestyle that fits what we make or what our hours are or how we work. And it might be younger people are more flexible and they would be good workers. Well, then we might want to offer the um, student loan package as a benefit to everybody, but we know that it's going to attract more 25-year-olds than 55-year-olds. Sure. Or we, we need a more seasoned workforce and we may go towards the 401k or the vacation time. They're trying to figure out who are they looking for, who's going to be attracted by what we do. Um, and then that's what we're going to offer in an, or in, in an effort to try to be, we're the best at this. We're the best at childcare. We're the best at transportation. We're the best at vacation time. We're the best at pay. And then try to figure out how we parlay that into more people. Got it. Thank you. Any other Hi, questions? Hi, Jim. Hey, Van. I, how are you, sir? I'm doing all right. I don't look as good as you, but I'm doing okay. Well, it's something about the glam filter that makes it a lot easier for some of us. Um, and I meant to say, gall darn it, buddy. Um, so you talked about the Emerging Leaders Program. We have we have one in house here, but it, how how what have you seen firms do, or or how have firms marketed that up front to be able? And it's one thing to say, hey, you know, we can develop you internally, but have you seen marketing efforts to try to leverage that? when it is successful in-house? Yeah, and I think with companies, especially with younger workers, maybe the first job or second job, you know, I've seen, and you would have it, you know, at the, at the firm, you know, maybe part of our emerging leaders is, we're gonna rotate you through the firm for your first year. You're gonna get to spend two months in audit and two months in CPA and two months in something else, because we want you to see the whole firm, learn the whole organization and find out where you think you fit and maybe what boss you might relate to. So your first year here is really going to be a learning experience. That might appeal to somebody. Um, or we take all of our under 30s and we put them into this group and they do project management and, you know, and this, and you're going to get to one, know your other people that you're working with that are close to you in age. And two, you're going to work on some significant things for the firm that's going to help us in the long run. And it'll be your name on that. Those are the types of things that I think, especially the younger workers are saying, wow, I'm going to get some opportunities here. I'm not being pigeonholed into this job. That's what they're selling. And, and that's something that I th would think would be difficult to communicate prior to you know, a, uh, an interview, a one-on-one -on -one or, or whatever. It, it, you have any examples of how somebody can put that out, out front or is that... Yeah. Yeah. I think the way that a lot of companies have done it is, you know, by especially depending on the type of person you're looking for, but if most of the people you're looking for are four year degreed or two year degreed, you know where they are for two years and four years. And so, to the extent that you can get to know the leaders in the college of, you know, who does do the career fairs, who does the career planning, who does those things, and they know 
that Bernd has this emerging leaders thing and they're talking to some young wannabe an accountant and they're saying, hey, they got a cool thing over there for their emerging leaders where you get to do this, that, and the other thing. If they're learning about it as a sophomore or a junior or coming to do an internship with you and learning about it and seeing what you have here, you're building a supply chain now that backs up two, three, four years earlier than anybody else. And so you're getting your hands on somebody at 18, 19, 20, so you can sell them on 22, 23, and 24. Yeah, it's good, good advice. Thank you. Yep. Um, Lisa, you're on mute, but while you while you um, take care of that, I just I do want to say too um, to to Jim's point about um, you know the lack of workforce and you know um, more more people leaving um, our state than coming in and, and that type of thing. I know that we're all looking at alternatives to and kind of um, looking outside the box to workforce. So if anybody um, is interested um, or you know. Uh, uh, have talent um, as one of their hurdles, I highly, highly recommend coming, I know it's, it's short notice, but coming tomorrow um, to our economic development update where we'll have um, Mission Wisconsin and Operation Fresh Start speakers from both of those organizations, and they are both doing incredible things to attract talent to our state. Um, so would recommend that you hop out and register for that if you haven't already. Um, couple other things we have coming up. New member micro group um, is on March 22nd or 7th. I'm sorry. Business Works is on April 4th. This um, is a great way to not only get the information, but there's like work time um, during that for you to kind of begin um, working on how to design your culture statement um, and that type of thing, or to, um, you know, make sure that your culture statement has everything that it needs. And then of course, April 6th is Get Moving Middleton. Lisa, anything else? Um, any other questions from anyone today? Um, so I wanna thank Jim for coming to present today as well as our sponsor, Upper Iowa University. Um, I did put the chat for tomorrow's economic development update in. Um, so if you wanna just to click on that right now and register, that would be great. Um, and then post event, again, Jim's gonna send the slide deck over to me. Um, I've been recording, so you will all uh, receive that soon. Anything else?